Thank you, and it's a pleasure to be here with you at your um, inaugural, is it, quality conference. Well, the inaugural sounds like there's going to be another one. I'm not sure whether that's true. But anyway, I guess we'll see. Uh, yeah, as Mark said, I'm um, responsible for all, almost all of the review work we do. The only bit you can't blame me for is uh, reviews of um, universities in Scotland, which are um, managed by a separate office that we have uh, up in, in Glasgow. What I hope to do uh, today, as the title suggests, is to talk a little bit about what we can learn from the outcomes of QA review, focusing uh, specifically on the outcomes of um, what is our current review method for reviewing uh, higher education delivered in universities and further education colleges. And that method is called Higher Education Review, and that was launched uh, in January 2013. Um, so we've got about 18 months of experience with that. To contextualise that, I'll, I'll begin, by tell you some, be, begin by telling you something more about the QAA, um, about what we do, a bit more about how the review uh, process works, higher education review, uh, to tell you about, a bit more about the quality code, which um, is in effect the, the rule book for higher education review, uh, and then to look at the outcomes, uh, thinking about what has tended to lead to good and bad judgments, but hopefully focusing, as the uh, uh, title of the presentation suggests, more on the good stuff rather than the bad stuff, which um, is actually um, quite... Uh, it's a good opportunity for me to do that. We tend to spend a lot of time worrying about things that are going wrong uh, in, in colleges and universities, and perhaps not as much time as we should recognising and celebrating those uh, elements which are, are really um, delivering good outcomes for students. And the, on our final slide, I'm just going to show you some um, resources that help you get some further information about what I'm talking about. There are some web links in there, and I'm hoping this thing is internet connected so that they will work. Okay, firstly then, uh, introduction to the QAA. So, uh, for those who don't know, we're, we're an independent body. We're not um, officious civil servants. We're not uh, civil servants anyway. Um, <laughs> we're, we're an independent body. We're a registered charity, company limited, company limited by guarantee. We're based, HQ is in Gloucester. So, one of the very few national organisations with a HQ in Gloucester. Uh, we've also got offices in, in London and uh, in Glasgow and Cardiff. And there's maybe a, a, an airport lounge set settee somewhere in, in Belfast to help us with the Northern Irish stuff. But So we're based all over the UK, founded almost 20 years ago and funded primarily by subscriptions for, from universities like this one uh, and also by contracts from the, the funding bodies uh, in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So um, although of course higher education is a devolved matter in this country, we span the whole of the UK. And there's our, our missions up there, safeguarding standards and improving the quality of UK higher education wherever it is delivered around the world. And that is the last uh, subclause there, impressing the fact that, uh, of course, there's lots of UK higher education being delivered outside the UK. I guess you must have heard a fair bit about that this morning. As far as what we do is concerned, well, I guess what we're uh, most known for are those top two bullets. We carry out external reviews of higher education providers. So um, all kinds of higher education providers now, universities, FE, colleges, uh, and the so-called alternative providers, those are private colleges that aren't receiving any um, funding directly from the government. We carry out reviews of all of those, um, and I think that adds up to something like six or 700 uh, providers of higher education in the UK now who are subject to QA <laughs> review in one form or another. Universities like this one uh, have tended to be reviewed once every four, five or six years. Colleges tend to be on a slightly shorter interval. The second bullet about the UK Quality Code, um, as I said, I mentioned that for, for the purposes of higher education review, that's a, in a sense the kind of the rule book for the review, but it has a much wider purpose than that. Um, we uh, maintain, we publish the UK Quality Code for higher education, but we don't own that. That's owned. We we do those uh, perform those functions on behalf of the sector. What the code is, uh, is a set of expectations which set out what universities and colleges can expect from one another in terms of the uh, services they're providing to students and uh, the work that they do to, uh, to uphold standards. Uh, and those expectations, of course, also um, describe to students what they can expect from universities and colleges, in fact, what any stakeholder can expect from um, higher education institutions in this country. And I will talk a little bit more about the code and how it's constructed in a moment. We're heavily involved in the dissemination of good practice, uh, partly through the events like this one, talking about the outcomes of review, uh, and also through some um, databases, one of which I'll show you later on. 
Student engagement is a, a work we've been very heavily involved in uh, for a number of years. I guess the, the, the trailblazers were in, in Scotland where uh, students were involved first as involved as reviewers on external reviews probably about 10 years ago now and that's a model that we've rolled out uh, across the UK. Uh, we've also got uh, two students on our governing board and we actually have a, a student advisory board now which is a formerly a sub board of the, of the QA board providing uh, advice to the QA board about um, uh, aspects of student engagement. That's a really fundamental part of our work. I'm really delighted to see a number of our student reviewers um, now, uh, I think, achieving, get, getting to the point where they are among the very best reviewers that we've got, uh, bar none. International work, uh, including with international agencies, what's, that's manifest in a number of ways. Uh, we, for example, carry out reviews of transnational education. That's uh, education which is um, provided by or leading to awards of UK institutions overseas. That could be at branch campuses, it could be through collaborative arrangements uh, with um, partners overseas or it could be through distance learning. Um, and we tend to conduct one of those uh, review activities every year. The last one that we did uh, was in the Caribbean. The next one's in the Mediterranean. It all sounds a bit glamorous. Uh, although the, one of the Mediterranean countries being visited this year is Greece. Maybe not quite so glamorous at the moment. <laughs> Uh, and other, the other countries we've, we've visited recently include China and India and uh, Malaysia uh, uh, and so on. And the approach we tend to take is to sample a, uh, an, uh, a number of links between UK institutions and institutions overseas and to, to look in detail about how the, those links are working as a means to provide external quality assurance of, 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 the, uh, of UK provision being delivered outside the UK. We've also got a number of uh, links with our counterpart organisations in other countries. We, for example, have a, an MOU with our, our Malaysian counterparts. We've got about uh, 10 or 15 of those. Uh, and they're very much um, uh, vehicles for, for working with those agencies to try, uh, for example, to make sense in some cases of the regulatory burden, which we, we know universities like this one may face when they're trying to set up and manage um, uh, pr uh, partnerships uh, internationally. We are increasingly seeking to try and work in partnership with our counterpart organisations overseas to do things in a collaborative way, uh, try and take a, a joined up view about um, uh, UK institution uh, provision being delivered outside uh, these borders. Training and events for HE providers, um, I guess fairly self-explanatory. And two, two more functions which perhaps may be not quite so obvious First one is we provide advice to government on applications for degree awarding powers. So if an institution in this country wants powers to award its own foundation degrees or bachelor's degrees or research degrees, uh, they go through a scrutiny which is managed by the QAA and then we then give advice to the government, uh, or to, officially to the Privy Council at least in England, about whether uh, we think that that organisation is uh, capable of uh, having those powers. And finally, um, we regulate the access to higher education diploma. This is a qualification for some people who are sometimes called second chances, perhaps people who didn't do very well at school, but later on in life want to get back into higher education. The access to higher education diploma is a qualification which allows them to do that. And uh, we regulate the award of those uh, diplomas. Okay then, that's a little bit on the work of the QA. Just now... Um, Given what I'm going to say about the outcomes of higher education review, I thought it might be helpful if we just looked for a moment at how that process works. Fundamentally, higher education review is a very simple process and one which is probably very familiar to, to anybody, including outside the UK, who's involved in quality assurance of, of higher education. Uh, and the five stages are set out there. Important, I guess, to start by saying that it's a peer review process. So these reviews are carried out by peers, and by peers we mean staff, who are working in other institutions and students who are studying uh, at other institutions. And the process uh, are set out there. Uh, normally submission of some evidence by the provider that's going through review, analysis of that evidence by a peer review team, a visit to the uh, provider, and we always visit regardless of the size of the provision, and there's some very small provision out there. Uh, in some cases numbering in uh, fewer than 10 higher education students. A review visit 
obviously giving our peers the opportunity to meet students, to meet staff, to meet employers, in some cases meet other stakeholders. Uh, to, and of course the meetings with students being particularly important uh, to get the, um, the word from the horse's mouth, as it were, about the experience of students at that institution. That then leads to a report which is published and finally an action plan which sets out how the provider is going to seek to take forward the outcomes of, of that review. And I just thought I'd tell you what the judgment areas are because this will help to contextualise what I say in a moment. We're making judgments in these reviews in four areas. Uh, in standards, in quality of learning opportunities, uh, in information and enhancement. And just to explain those very briefly, uh, by standards we're talking about the level of achievement that a student has to reach in order to get a bachelor's award or a master's award or a research degree. Quality is all the things which a university or college is doing to help its students achieve a particular qualification. So that's teaching, academic and pastoral support, uh, library resources, IT resources, uh, admissions and so on. Uh, information I hope is fairly uh, self-explanatory and of course information being increasingly important these days that uh, you colleagues may have picked up uh, recently the publication by the uh, um, CMA of some guidance about how universities and colleges can make, make sure they're not falling foul of uh, consumer protection legislation on, on information. And finally enhancement, uh, perhaps another, another way of putting that is improving uh, the way in which uh, universities and colleges are providing uh, learning opportunities to students. I, say, I said I'd, I would say a little bit about the quality code. I think the quality code has something of an image problem. Um, it's uh, uh, certainly uh, uh, construed by some people as a, a kind of a manual, a very long manual at that, about exactly how higher education should be managed and provided. That's certainly what it's not supposed to be. Um, actually, when you boil it down to its expectations, those things which um, uh, the sector has agreed that uh, should be expected of every institution, it's 19 expectations, and not all of those apply to every institution. For example, there's a, an expectation about research degrees, which clearly does not apply to providers that don't have any research degrees. The, the, all the, the other stuff, or m much of the other stuff, is very much about providing information and guidance to providers about how they should um, manage and provide higher education. So it's not mandatory, it's supposed to be uh, helpful, uh, and um, uh, we hope that it's, uh, it, it, it's received in that spirit, although we know in some cases uh, that it perhaps isn't. It's, it's divided into three sections, as you can see there, section or part dealing with standards, a part dealing with uh, quality, and a part about uh, information. There isn't a dedicated section on enhancement, Enhancement is a sort of a thread which runs throughout the, the whole thing. And just to give you an example of one of these expectations, that's the one about admissions. So it kind of gives you a flavour of an expectation, very much uh, kind of high-level expectation about uh, principles. And then, as I said, there are 19 of, of, of these expectations uh, dealing with different facets of, of higher education. Hopefully nothing in there in that expectation which uh, you would argue with. Okay, then coming on to um, higher education review and the outcomes uh, so far. We've done about 120, 130 of these higher education reviews now since the uh, method started about 18 months ago. In the first year, uh, there are only two universities went through the process. We're standing in one of them. Uh, another one's very nearby, Bradford. Um, and the other, uh, the other 45 providers that went through in that year were, were FE colleges. In the current year, we've got a few more uh, universities going through. I think there are 21, but still a majority are, are colleges. So the HER story so far, the, sorry, the Higher Education Review, I, you may hear me refer to this as HER. The HER story so far is predominantly a uh, college higher education story or, or, or an HE in FE college uh, uh, story. Uh, and... So what a lot of what I'm about to say um, comes out of the work that we've done with, with FE colleges. We've had uh, one university so far with an unsatisfactory judgment. It wasn't this one. It was the other one nearby, but I won't um, uh, name them. <laughs> and so far this year, we've had eight uh, uh, universities with commendations. I'll just sorry, stop there just to talk about the gradation of the judgments. I mentioned the judgment areas before. I didn't, didn't mention the, the, the grades, if you like. 
Uh, in most areas, there are four possible uh, grades. Um, the worst one is does not meet expectations. Then there's a requires improvement to meet expectations, meets UK expectations, or there's a commended judgment as well. And the first two of those, the does not meet and the requires improvement, are regarded as, quotes, unsatisfactory judgments. So we've had one of those um, an un unsatisfactory judgment. That was Bradford had some problems with its um, postgraduate research provision at the time. And we've had eight universities who've been uh, had one of these commended judgments. Um, a bit of a contrast with the situation in, 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 uh, in the college sector where outcomes have been much more varied. We've had about one third of reviews uh, in colleges leading to one or more of these unsatisfactory judgments. And I'll just talk a little bit about some of the common themes that we've seen in those. Um, as I said, I didn't want to dwell so much on, on, on the problems that we found, and we'll look at the good stuff in a moment. But just for a, anyway, just for, for, for a short moment, common themes uh, among colleges uh, uh, facing unsatisfactory judgments seem to be issues like a lack of central oversight, so perhaps HE being managed and delivered in pockets throughout colleges uh, rather than uh, being managed centrally, poor student engagement with higher education, a focus on operations rather than strategy, I guess that is often linked to the first point, Management in flux, we've seen a lot of cases where uh, a lot of turnover, in, in, particularly in senior management in colleges, which um, I guess is uh, connected to some of the funding problems which that sector is facing. And in some cases, some turbulence in awarding relationships. A few examples where, for example, awarding universities have switched from franchising arrangements to validation arrangements, and in that process have perhaps uh, withdrawn some of the privileges that students in colleges had. For example, whereas under a franchise arrangement, a student may have been able to access the awarding body's library. Under a validation arrangement, maybe they can't, and that might lead to some, some uh, challenges and qualities, I'm sure you can imagine. The last thing I was just going to mention as far as uh, problems are concerned is there seems to be an emerging relationship now between outcomes in colleges and uh, the size of the provision. And to illustrate that, we've got... Um, this one here. So what's that that's showing you on the left hand side? That's the size of provision broken down by the number of students and on the bottom that's the percentage of pro providers in that category with at least one unsatisfactory judgment. So for example among colleges that have fewer than 250 HE students you can see that almost half of those colleges are attracting uh, one or more unsatisfactory judgments and it tails off as the provision grows. That's also reinforced in other data. So, for example, the largest college that has uh, received one unsatisfactory judgment has about 1,000 students. The largest college getting two unsatisfactory judgments is 700. And the largest college with three bad judgments is just less than 500. Now, I'm st I stress here that the relationship there is not the same as a causal factor. We need to do further analysis to see whether that's true. And if size is a factor, it may not be the absolute size of that provision, but it might be the size of that provision relative to other provision, because, of course, all further education colleges have lots of other provision as well, and for some of them, higher education is very much a, a, a niche or minority area. If there's a silver lining in this, uh, this finding, I guess it's that uh, as providers with more of these unsatisfactory judgments have smaller provision, uh, that naturally leads to there being fewer students across the sector studying at those providers. So I guess it would be more worrying if the reverse was true, as the impact on students uh, would be greater. OK, so let's think now, the, the, uh, forgetting for a moment then about the bad stuff, let's on, on the good stuff. We've had so far six published double commendations. So this are, these are providers that have had two of these commended judgments. And in fact, the only providers that have had commended, two commended judgments have been FE colleges. There are six published ones listed there. And there are probably two more in the pipeline, but I can't tell you about those yet because they are still going through the report, reporting process. So, my, I always pronounce this top one wrong. Is it Myers Co? Myers Co, I think it is, rather than Myers Co College. Um, one of the largest uh, providers of, of HE courses in land-based and sports subjects, about 1,000 students. I think UCLan is their awarding body. Ask and Brian. Um, uh, founded as a Yorkshire Agricultural Institute, so again, another sort of land-based theme running here. Reese Heath College uh, in Nantwich in Cheshire. Uh, Dean Valley College. I think it, it uh, did or 
has or had this university as one of its uh, awarding bodies. Uh, Hart, heading a bit further south, Hartbury College, which is very near uh, where QA is based in Gloucester. Again, um, certain, uh, a very much uh, focus on, on uh, agricultural subjects, equine studies, very, very highly regarded. And uh, going slightly further south again, South Devon College, which is more of a, you might say, a mixed or, or general uh, FE college. So what can we learn from those colleges that have uh, achieved uh, two commended judgments? Well, of course, we need to stress that every college is different. Each of these uh, colleges has its own sort of unique success story. Uh, and indeed, we believe that one of the strengths of the QAA process is its ability to deal with each provider on its own terms uh, and recognise excellence in that context. And if you've got the time, I, I certainly would encourage you to read the full reports of those uh, reviews uh, which underlie what I'm about to say. And, and on the last slide, we'll look at how you can access some further information. But if you look at those, um, th those colleges and the 70 or so examples of good practice which our reviewers pulled out from those colleges, some common themes do emerge listed there. So first, a common sense of integration or coordination of teaching and other student support systems. A real feeling that each part of that system understands its role uh, as part of a whole and they're all pulling in the same direction for the benefit of students, academic and professional development. Second theme is about partnerships and genuine and meaningful partnerships between providers or colleges in this case and their three main stakeholders, students, employers and awarding bodies. So partnerships with students being manifest in all kinds of ways, in course design, in monitoring and review, uh, in development of information for current and prospective students, uh, and so on. Partnerships with employers reflected also in course design, also in, uh, in course delivery, in assessment and review, and also in the provision of effective and relevant work placements. And finally, with awarding bodies, partnership reflected in full and active participation in the awarding bodies' processes, and not in a subordinate role, but in the spirit of mutuality between awarding body and uh, partner college. Fourth one there is focusing more on enhancement, and the third, the, sorry, the third one, and the theme there is about a strategic and holistic approach to enhancement. And that's not to say that colleges are taking a, a sort of an authoritarian approach top down to enhancement, which is blind to the needs and the suggestions of, of individual disciplines. But there is also ownership clearly at these, in these colleges of enhancement at the most senior levels and a desire to push improvements which are in the longer term interests of the students and in the institution as a whole. And fourth, uh, some evidence in these colleges that in some areas dedicated higher education systems and processes um, are, are required. And I know this is sometimes an area which we get into trouble a bit because we're accused of, of uh, suggesting that colleges have to overhaul all of their processes in the interest of HE. I don't think that's true, but in some cases, including those areas lifted, listed here, staff development, scholarship, professional engagement, and so on, these colleges are doing things which are dedicated to HE, and our reviewers certainly see that as making a positive difference. Okay, then, final slide. I'm running out of time. I said, I promised what I would do is uh, just uh, give you some uh, insights into how you might get some additional information about all of this, and in the hope that this is going to work, I'll just show you four things very briefly. Build your own quality code. Now, that's not to say that you can ignore the rest of it. Um, what, 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 I'll show you in a minute what that means. There's a college higher education toolkit, a special, a special one we developed for colleges, uh, a review knowledge base, which allows you to get further information about some of the things I've said, and also some good practice cases. I'll just say, show you this very briefly. So... Um, if you are interested in what the code has to say about a particular issue, so you can see ones that are listed here. Let's say, for example, you're interested in what the code has to say about equality and diversity. That's scattered among different areas of the code. But if you use this tool, you can tick that box. And it, uh, I won't do it now because it'll probably take, it'll take a little bit too long. But you can have a bespoke document created for you with all the references to equality and diversity that in the code and have that emailed to you uh, for, your, for your convenience. Uh, College Higher Education Toolkit is a, a document, oh, it's gone straight to it, which uh, it's 
it's a, it's, a, it's a fairly long document, but what we've, we've, we've tried to do with this document is to put ourselves in the shoes of, of higher education, uh, of, of further education colleges who are delivering higher education and giving them some, some hints and tips and prompts to things to think about when they are preparing for one of our reviews and indeed when they're thinking about the management and provision of higher education more generally. The review knowledge base uh, is... Let's say you're interested in uh, mining uh, our review reports for information about a particular uh, area. So let's say um, you're interested in what review reports have to say about external examiners. And let's say you're not bothered about, you're interested in examples of good practice in external examining. It's a very intuitive um, search function which will bring up all the examples of good practice you can see here that have been identified in QA reports related to external examining and, and then you can link through to the, to the full reports themselves. Whoops. And finally, some good practice case studies. So um, if you're even more interested in particular uh, areas, uh, what we've done based on those examples of good practice that we've identified in reports is to go back to those institutions and invited them to say more about good practice in particular areas and, and they're listed there and if you click through to those you get two or three pages about each of those. Okay, um, by coincidence I've run exactly to time. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy to answer any questions quickly but I'll be around for the rest of the day. I think um, uh, I'll be at the dinner as well this evening for those of you that are lucky enough to go to that one. So um, thank you very much. <laughs>